My role is to provide you with insights on what's going on in the world of business today in a way that I hope that you can take back with you things that you want to be doing differently as a result, and perhaps even more importantly, helping your clients do things differently as well. Now, since every person in here is a technology person, I want to start with a particular telling piece of technology, right? A piece of technology that has revolutionized its particular industry. Let me know if you've ever seen this technology before. Right, have you seen these devices? Right, this is known as the Gumball Wizard. And it's from a company called Global Gumball, and it has revolutionized the gumball industry. What happens here is that a person goes up to it, it puts his quarter in the slot, and when he turns the crank, he doesn't get a gumball, at least not right away. Instead, what he gets is the gumballing experience. As it goes spiraling down, clickety-clack as it goes, until it reaches the bottom. Now, if you think about it, there's no functional purpose whatsoever for this device. <laughs> you don't get a better manufactured good. I mean, the gumball is the same as it's always been. You don't get better service. In fact, you could say the service is actually worse. Why? Right, it takes longer to get the goods that you requested. But why does it have more value? Right? It has more value because of the experience that you receive from the technology. In fact, I've seen now uh, gumball machines that are like kinetic sculptures where the, the gumball is spiraling this way and that, parachuting around, jumping around. I've seen some that are like pinball machines where you're batting that gumball around. Right? Here you want to take as long as possible before it drains down the middle and you retrieve your gumball. I mean, so engaging is this experience. I've seen kids go up to their parents, ask them for a quarter, put the quarter in the slot, turn the crank, excitedly have that gumball experience, right? pick it up and go throw it away and ask their parents for another quarter. It's really just a slot machine for kids is what it is. <laughs> so why is this happening? Why do we see technology like this? Well, it's because of a very fundamental change in the very fabric of the economy. And to describe that change, let me go back to the beginning. Because in the beginning were commodities. Commodities are things that you grow in the ground, pull out of the ground, or raise in the ground. Animal, mineral, vegetable. And then you extract them out of the ground to sell them on the open marketplace. Commodities are the basis of the agrarian economy that lasted for millennia. In fact, you can go back to the year 1776. And of course, I picked that year for a very important reason. As you all know, on July 4th, 1776, the world's first economics book was published. Something else happened that day, but I forget what it was. But if you go back to 1776, what would you guess was the percent of people that were employed on farms? It's over 90%. Over 90% of the people are employed on farms. But what's it down to today? It's down to almost 2%. From over 90% to 2%, with output skyrocketing. Thanks to technological and productivity improvements, it takes fewer and fewer people to produce more and more output. So people moved out of farms and into factories where they make or manufacture goods. Goods are the physical, tangible things that we touch and feel. Goods are the basis of the industrial economy. Go back 100 years ago, at the turn of the 20th century, over 40% of the people that were employed were employed in manufacturing jobs. Today, that's down to 12%. Again, from 40% to 12%, meanwhile, output skyrocketed. Again, thanks to technological and productivity improvements, it takes fewer and fewer people to produce more and more goods. So people moved out of factories and into offices, into hotels, into restaurants, into hospitals, where they deliver a set of intangible activities on behalf of an individual person. That's what a service is. And today, 80% of employment is in services. 80% of gross domestic product is in services. And 80% of what customers want is, in fact, the service, not the good. What happens in the service economy is that goods become commoditized. Commoditized, meaning they're treated like a commodity, where people don't care who makes them, they don't care about the brand, they don't care about the features, because they're all pretty much the same anyway. They care about three things and three things only. Price, price, and price. Right? That's when goods have been commoditized. And there are two great forces of commoditization today. One is, of course, the internet. 
The frictionless marketplace means that customers can instantly compare prices from one vendor to another, and that tends to push them down to the lowest possible price. Do you know what the other great force of commoditization is? It's a certain company in Bentonville, Arkansas, right? Walmart. Right, Walmart. Walmart's entire reason for existence is to commoditize all of the goods it has for sale so it can pass on the savings to its customers. But what's happening today is more and more Walmart is getting into services. Photographic services, food services, optometric services, increasingly financial and healthcare services. And also even the internet can commoditize services. What used to cost you know, several hundred dollars to buy or sell a block of shares with a full service broker can cost now as low as $3 with an internet-based broker. So services are being commoditized as well. What that means is that goods and services are no longer enough. Goods and services are everywhere becoming mere commodities. It's time to move beyond goods and services to the next level of economic value, and that is staging experiences for your customers. And if you remember one thing and one thing only from our time together, remember this. And that is that experiences are a distinct economic offering, as distinct from services as services are from goods. Experiences are basically when you use goods as props and services as the stage to engage each and every person in an inherently personal way, and thereby create a memory, which is the hallmark of the experience. So now we're shifting into an experience economy where experiences are becoming the predominant economic offering. Let me show you a number of companies that are leading the way into the experience economy. You see theme restaurants like Hard Rock Cafe, founded in London in 1971, where they merged rock music with food service to create a unique dining experience. You can get a rock of a different kind at REI, Recreational Equipment Incorporated, based in Seattle, where for a $15 fee or $5 if you're a member of the co-op, you can climb the 60-foot mountain they're placing inside their stores to test out the climbing gear. At their flagship store in Seattle, they have a bicycle trail outside of it. The store in Minneapolis, near where I live, has a cross-country ski trail in the winter. The store in Denver has a kayaking experience on a river right next to the REI store. The whole notion is to get you to experience the goods before you buy them, and then they know the chances you will buy them go up. You see experiences increasingly in hotels. This, in fact, is my favorite hotel to stay at in Manhattan. It's the Library Hotel on Madison Avenue and 41st Street. In fact, if you go out those doors and look to your right, there is the New York Public Library. So I decided to name it after the library uh, that is there on 31st Street. But they themed it Dewey Decimal System. Right? That's the theme of the Library Hotel, Dewey Decimal System. Every floor in the library is a different classification. There is a literature floor, a philosophy floor, a geography floor, history, science, mathematics, and so forth. And then every room on every floor is a different subclassification within that genre. So you can go to the history floor, for example, and there could be, there'll be a 20th century history room. There'll be an ancient Roman history room and a Greek room and so forth. So when you go into then your room, you know that you have books from that particular classification. Now this being a boutique hotel, there's 10 floors, six rooms in every floor. Right? How often do you have to go to be able to experience it all? Because right, they create a theme in which every room is, in fact, different from every other room. You see it in real libraries. This is the Cerritos Public Library in Cerritos, California, where the head librarian, Wayne Pearson, realized that the Internet was commoditizing his own business. Right, people would ask him, say, what are you going to need libraries for in the future when you can access every book that has ever been written over the Internet? So he decided to create a role for libraries in the future, and he created what he called the World First Experience Library. The theme of the Cerritos Library is journey through time. Journey through time. It is a journey through time when you go through there. There is a classic period, a modern period, an art deco period, a futurist period. The children's library is themed after a prehistoric period with a life-size Tyrannosaurus Rex dinosaur inside of there. And then they have all these rituals based on time. For example, when it's time to close the library, they make an announcement that the Cerritos Library is about ready to close. You know, most libraries have a problem of shooing people out of all the nooks and crannies that they have inside of there. Well, at the Cerritos Library, they make that announcement. Everybody starts pulling their stuff together. They put their books away, and they come downstairs and gather together around this huge display screen where in the evening they play the song or the scene from The Sound of Music, right, where the kids are singing, so long, farewell, Avita saying goodbye. And as they sing along, you know, everybody goes through the motions, they sing along with it, and they know by the time that last kid sings goodbye, 
that the library is closed and will have to come another day. So successful is this that within six months of opening, circulation went up two and a half times in the Cerritos Public Library. And in a town of a little over 50,000 southeast of Los Angeles, over 7,000 people are in the library on average every single day. Right? Over 7% of the population is in the library every single day because of the great experience that they created. And you can see this in virtually every industry. One of the industries I work with the most is, in fact, healthcare. Mid-Columbia Medical Center in uh, Dow's Oregon is a small 50-bed hospital. And here the CEO, Mark Scott, a number of years ago, realized that he had lost control of his industry, that HMOs were taking over, and they were dictating to him what procedures he could run and how much he could charge for them and so forth. So he took as his theme what's known as the plain tree philosophy, which is three words, personalize, humanize, demystify. And what he does in every decision that he and the board makes from on down are whether it better personalizes, humanizes, or demystifies the experience. To personalize the experience, for example, you get to choose your own artwork that goes on your walls. You get to choose the own style and color of your robe that you wear. You know, whether it closes in back or not, completely up to you. <laughs> he demystifies... Uh, he humanizes that experience by making it like a bed and breakfast inn. It's not a cold, impersonal hospital. And he demystifies that experience by giving you and your family all of the information that you need to know about your care path and about what they're going to do and how you can become a part of that entire healing process. In fact, they give you access to your own medical record. They do have to explain as you read what the doctors are writing about you. If you see the initials SOB, it stands for shortness of breath. So just, just so you know that. But within that, he, he creates this great experience. This is a small hospital, as I mentioned, that used to serve just two counties on, on each side of the Columbia River in Oregon and Washington. Now there have been patients at Mid-Columbia from over 28 different states right, because of the experience that they have created in there, particularly in their Celilo Cancer Center. And you see it, of course, in technology industries. Right? This is a company founded by Robert Stevens in Minneapolis who wanted to install and repair computers, and he said, well, who better do that than geeks? So he named the company, of course, the Geek Squad. And Robert says that he doesn't interview prospective employees, he auditions them, make sure he can typecast them as geeks, and then he costumes them, as you see here, in white shirts, thin black ties. The, the ties are clip-ons, just in case they get caught in the printer. They got black pants with things hanging off the belt, and the pants are usually just a little bit too short, you know what I mean? Better to show off the white socks that are part of the uniform. They drive around in these geek mobiles, right? Black and white beetles that are, that are colored like a squad car with a Geek Squad logo emblazoned on the side. And when they get to your home or to your offices, they make sure you know that they are from the Geek Squad and go through a number of performance routines. Robert says that his goal is to make the Geek Squad experience so engaging that his customers can't wait till the computers break down. <laughs> and you probably know the rest of the story, which is three and a half years ago, they were in fact bought by Best Buy. And Best Buy has placed Geek Squad precincts inside of every one of its units in North America, and now in China and England and, and other countries as well. Of course, you can't talk about the experience economy without talking about this man. Right, this is the true pioneer of the experience economy. You can date the experience economy, in fact, to July 17, 1955, when he opened Disneyland out in California. And then in 1971, came out here to Orlando to create Disney World, the world's premier experience stager, where they charge an admission fee just to get into the experience. And then, of course, that drives the demand for all the goods and services that they have for sale inside of there. And it is indeed the happiest place on earth. So this is, again, what's going on in the world. We've gone from an economy based off commodities, the agrarian economy, through an industrial economy based off goods, through a service economy, and now we're shifting to an experience economy. Right? That this is where economic value is being created today, is through experiences.